which is called beginning. At last, after an almost endless wait, the call came and I set out as I was. I was well prepared and from the drumming darkness I began to beat a way through my soft tunnel to the sweet, bewildering universe beyond. Believe me, I hadn't asked to be born, but still I pressed head first toward the light. I shan't say much about the attendant nun. Nothing distracted me. I knew what I had to do. I eased my greasy shoulders through a narrow, almost impassable fissure. Adventure, sorrow, puzzlement, delight were waiting. I pushed on through, breathed air, then wailed, and so again began. And there are quite a lot of poems in here about me, me at the age of five, me at the age of eight, me at the age of ten, and so on. And so on. Anyway, I shall spare you all of this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to become, uh, I'm going to be 14 in the next poem that you hear. It's called The Bomber. And it refers to the Windrush, which is not, not the, the famous boat which came over from the West Indies, but probably the river that the boat was named after. The poem is called The Bomber. The Windrush runs through field and village before it becomes the Thames. Clear water with waving weeds, minnows, sticklebacks, and where it bends, boys swimming, splashing, floating on their backs, diving off the bank. That's where I learnt to swim, a frantic doggy paddle that just kept me buoyant and lifted my feet from the stones at the bottom. That summer we lay on the bank and let the sun dry us off. We heard one glorious afternoon the grumbling engines of a plane, very low. A flying fortress lumbered into view, enormous with jagged holes in its fuselage, staggering through the air just above the willows. I saw blue through gaps in the wings. Amazed, frightened, we jumped to our feet and waved as if our frantic waving could keep him airborne. And the man we could see his face as he steered his wreck with hopes of reaching an airfield, waved back at the naked boys on the Windrush bank. Uh, I have a poem called A Cup of Water, which is about when I was in, I was in Wales. It, uh, like many of my other poems, it's a sonnet. Uh, it's, a, it's an unrhymed song, it, uh, so that's all, that's all right. Um, I think the first one was a rhymed song. It, it was, yes, um, but you probably didn't notice that because they're very quiet rhymes. A cup of water. I stopped at a farm to ask for water, walking the nine parched miles to the coast to swim and escape a while from the others. Well worth the walk, I'd bus it back though. It was early August. Very soon bombs would fall into Hiroshima and Nagasaki, far off cities with unforgettable names. Heat, I recall, and animal smells, and the tall, hollow ticking clock in the dark kitchen, its huge black hands, minute perfect, but two full hours behind. <laughs> this holding, wedged between Welsh mountains, had no truck with double summer time. The farm wife watched me drink without a word. Water, cold, tasting of iron, pumped from the earth. It did run, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I've forgotten that. And the next poem is uh, it's not a sonnet, it would be a <laughs> more line, but uh, I forgot to write the other line. Um, it's, it's called Gallery. I, by this time I'm a, a young adult. Um, and it does what a, several of the poems in this book do. I take two points of view. It's, a, it, uh, it's quite difficult to describe what I do. Uh, writing as a child, I, 
I, I, I am the child and I'm also me now, if I'm an old man, you know, uh, and I fuse the two things together as well as I can. This one does it slightly differently. It's called Gallery. Obviously it's winter. You're in a duffel coat which hides your shape. I'm lighting your fag. There's something touching about the way we stand. Our young bodies, you leaning toward me. We're outside the Angel Cafe. I'm turned away from the camera. A back, a raised arm, a hand holding a hip lit match, but you can tell it's me. Someone says, black and white, you can't beat it. Look at those paving stones. You can almost feel that dusk. It's superb. Look at that lettering. I loiter near Angel Lane couple, hoping to be recognised, but they're more interested in the dusk. The figures make it, someone says, and I suppose we did. <laughs> and one more of this sort of theme. Uh, I'm slightly young, younger here. I'm a, I'm a young sailor. Uh, I was a sailor at one time in my life, National Service sailor, and I was on my way from East London, where I was living at the time, to Waterloo Station, around about midnight, uh, and uh, this poem is slightly about that, but it's also about me now. It's quite complex in that way, but it's actually also very simple in another way. It's called, it's in, it's the title book of the, uh, title poem of the book, it's called A Good Time, and here it is. It's brick I notice most, grey brick and metal pipes. Windows are sightless, doors shut. I promised myself this walk alone through the town where someone with my name once lived. The railway line's on my right, but I go left into a narrow alley and then another where a woman offered me a good time. Her cheeks were thick with colour, her eyes bright. She grabbed my sleeve, I hurried on, frightened. Of what? A good time, son. And she was about the same age as my mother. Street names in block letters on square tiles. Salter's Alley, Grant Lane, Corporation Street. And I'm having a good time revisiting in my mind this maze of murky brick. The moon is behind cloud. A baker's van drives past. Mile after mile I walk from night to morning, step from the past straight on to the inseparable now. And um, I, have, I, I make a slight change of... I don't only do these intense, uh, serious poems. I actually take the mickey quite a bit. And... Uh, I, I also act as a sort of ghostwriter, um, and uh, you'll, some of you will be acquainted with the name of Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, <laughs> and he wrote a very fine poem which was about a pilgrimage to Canterbury. And in the general prologue of it, he, he, he wrote little sketches of a number of people of his era, uh, giving a sort of microcosm of, of what British life may hold southern, southern English life might have been like at the time with, with a miller and a priest and a nun and a, a knight and, a, and all kinds of odd people who, people who sold pardons and what not. But he left certain people out and I thought I'd fill the gap for it. And I, I've, in my time I've spent a certain amount of time uh, having to deal with arts administrators. Um, <laughs> I hope there are none in the audience here. Um, but um, anyway, I, I've filled in for Chaucer here. An arts administrator rode with us, not on a palfrey, but a project bus, which had been gaily painted over all with sundry pictures, multicultural. <laughs> Rembrandt, she knew, and Tracy Emin's bed, all the novelists and poets she had read. Much she liked sculptors and photographers, Though sooth to say, she most loved jewellers. <laughs> of strange earrings she had full rich a store. A silver tiger on her breast she wore, 
Her fingernails were as the rainbow hued. Her hair was coloured mauve. Her speech was rude, as though she were a very cockney. <laughs> though, truth to tell, she hailed from fair Surrey. <laughs> Her talk was all of grants and subsidies and sponsorships and eke funding bodies, for with her skills and her small mobile phone, she could draw gold and silver from a stone. <laughs> Yet ever was her whinging plain Tywin. Can't get the funding pet, know what I mean? <laughs> You've met her. <laughs> the, the, extraordinarily, I, 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 did, I was doing a week's course, a residential course somewhere, and I was doing a reading one of the evenings, and there was an arts administrator, in fact, the arts administrator for the area, was sitting in the audience, and she walked out. <laughs> and wouldn't speak to me for the rest of the week, and went around muttering about me. Uh, so I, I, I was quite... I, Mm -hmm. Oh, really, because it's only a joke, and it wasn't anything like her, mm -hmm. but I thought I'd won that one. Uh, <laughs> I thought I'd read you one of the uh, children's poems that I have in, uh, in my, well, again, in the Smith Doorstock book uh, called To Catch an Elephant, which is actually also an instructional book. It tells you how to do what's in the title. Um, this is a poem, however, called River Song. Where are you going? said Rover to River. You flow always downward. Why should that be? I gather the droplets of water together and carry them home to their mother, the sea. From moment to moment, said Rover to River, your waters are changing, yet you stay the same. No, I am the mocker of every map maker, although they outline me and give me a name. I'm banked and I'm bridged, said River to Rover. I'm built by, I'm fished in, I'm wished on as well. But I am a winder, I love to wander. Every day I am different, with stories to tell of floods and disasters, said River to Rover, of long, lazy summers with ducks in my reeds, of strange, ghostly hauntings, of wild otter huntings, of crisp, frozen winters with ice on my reeds. Of towns that surround me, said River to Rover, until I escape through the bridges to fields where brown cattle wallow beside my green willows and small beetles strut with their bright shining shields. And all the time downward, said River to Rover, I travel past building and boulder and tree. I gather the driplets and droplets together and hurry them home to their mother, the sea. Yeah, I, there are an awful lot of poets who write for children who think that all you've got to do is to make a joke about knickers and, uh, and rhyme it. Uh, and I, I, I think, you know, the children are entitled to their jokes about knickers, but I don't think adult writers should be complicit in sort of helping them along with this. I think they should be left to do it themselves. That's my own theory. Um, how am I doing? Oh, not so well. Um, we are, we're on a, a relations on that, but I've been running that scheme for 25 years uh, with two other people, uh, but we, we don't put our own stuff up often, but this one was, was up and the answer to the riddle wasn't given and it has caused a lot of discussion on the internet and things. I, I'm quite pleased with it, about that, but, but it kind of amuses me, all the strange answers that there have been to it and how skillfully wrong they are. <laughs> I mean, how, how, how I feel that I, they've got it right and I've got it wrong in a way. Anyway, here it is. I was the cause of great troubles, yet resting among leaves I did nothing wrong. After much waiting I was taken in hand, passed from one to another. Broken, I moved beyond sharp barriers and was cradled in wetness, mashed to pulp. Soon I entered a dark tunnel where, bathed in acids, I altered my being. But what I entered I also altered, bringing light where there had been darkness. I brought strife where there had been peace, pain where there had been comfort. My journey ended in the place of corruption, but by then I had changed the world. Mm.